Today, you got your Bibles, we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 1. We were there last week. I'm just going to give you, read one verse there. And then if you want to turn into Deuteronomy chapter 4, we'll go there after the verse in Ephesians. And as we've been talking about next, what next is in our personal lives. And this is a series, and this is part 8 in the series, Next. What is next? What's next for your life? Many people don't know what next is, and sometimes they have this mentality, all of us can get it, that, well, this is what it is, and nothing's ever going to change, and this is how it's supposed to be. And But there's a um, lack of hope in that understanding. I mean, you are where you are, no doubt. You can't change that. And the change that you can make, you want to make sure that these are the changes that God is bringing into your life and you're not changing for the sake of changing. And that where you are right now is because of purpose. And so I think the, this series of messages are opening our eyes to every detail, that we don't miss every detail that God... Um, has in our lives, that we just don't see things as, as we talked about last week, chance, random happenings, but that everything is according to purpose. Everything that's happening in our lives, good and bad, is according to the eternal purpose of God. God working it together for His good, His purpose, and we get to be involved in it. His good is my good. His purpose is my purpose. I don't call the shots. It's not about me. So I don't have this mentality that it's, you know, me, 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 but that it's all about him and what he's purposed. Now, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, that's, I just want to look at this one part where it says, Even as in his love he has chosen us. This choosing we've been talking about is in accordance with his love. If you miss this, this is another ingredient. It's like last week. If you missed last week, you missed the whole key to this series. You might as well just pack up that series and throw it away because you can't open it up without the key of last week. See, because it's a line upon line series of messages. And one hinges upon the other. I can't just share everything in one setting. It's like God gives this revelation. We unravel it into a series of of messages, but one, one hinges upon the other. But last week is key. This week is part two of that key. If you don't understand that everything that God is doing for us by way of, the, of his eternal purpose, that it's all in love, then you're going to look at a God up there that just doesn't care about you. And that these instances or these happenings, whatever you want to call them in your life, is a God who just blinked his eye and hell broke loose. Or God's just not paying attention to me. He's an absentee father and he really doesn't care with what's going on. No, you have to understand that the lens you're looking through is the lens that, of love that he has for you. And that is a perfect love. And nothing is happening in your life without the love of God overshadowing it or looking at it or governing it if you will now in Deuteronomy chapter 4 in verse 20 it says but the Lord has taken you he's talking about the, the, the nation of Israel he's taken you and brought you forth out of the iron furnace even out of Egypt to be unto him a people a inheritance as you are this day. So God took Israel, separated them out of the world, Egypt, for his own possession, for his own inheritance. Now God sees us as a possession, as an inheritance. It's all motivated by a perfect love that he has for us. In 1 John, I think it is, where he says, perfect love cast out all fear. When you understand that the, the, the love that God has for you, you don't fear anything because you are being governed by that love. And that, that that love 
is not allowing anything into your life that he's not, that he's, that's going to take you out of his purpose. And that when you see things happening, you've got to know that they are orchestrated and engineered by divine love. But that he has called us to be his inheritance, his possession. Now, in the, uh, one of the parables that Jesus gives, he talks about a guy who is, um, finds his field. But in this field, there's a treasure. And the treasure, nobody, nobody sees. It's like you buy a house and you're looking around, all of a sudden you see something in that house that's worth more than the house. Right? So now that house means more to you than anybody else because you know there's a possession, there's a treasure in that house no one else saw but you did. There's maybe a, a secret passage or a door or something that that there was a treasure that's more, that's worth more than the house. Well, God says he saw a field. And in that field was the treasure. That field is the world. The treasure is his chosen. And he saw in the world a chosen people. Peter calls us a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a treasure, a holy people, a possession of God. And he said he sold everything that he had to buy that field because of the worth of the treasure that's in that field. So God saw in Egypt a treasure called Israel. He didn't see all of Egypt. He didn't see Pharaoh and the Egyptians. He saw Israel as his chosen people, a treasure, a possession, an inheritance. That's who we are right now. God called us, chose us out of a world, out of an iron furnace of affliction. He called us out as a treasure of people, and he did it because of his love for us, unconditional love. He did this because of love. And then he talks about, and throughout Deuteronomy, where one of the scriptures, it says, you led us all these days through the wilderness. Love led them through the wilderness. God had a purpose and plan, motivated by love, and that love led them through the wilderness. So God, God's love is leading you through all the ups and downs that you may be going through. But you've got to understand, whatever it is, God's love is behind what's happening. If you miss that, then, you, you, then nothing means anything. Right? Nothing means anything. You know why a gift means something? Well, it, today's generation, I don't know, or this world, a gift is only, it means something to us because of the value of the gift. But it's got to go beyond that. Really what a gift is, it came from you. You gave me a gift. I'm not just going to look at the value of what that gift means to me. I'm going to look at, wow, you thought of me. You went out and you took time and you bought this with your own money and you wrapped it. You, did, this was, you were thinking about me the whole time because it's just not the gift. It's the love and the care behind the gift. But we miss that in this generation. Huh? We just think, well, yeah. What's that? Oh, the so-and-so got me that. You can have it if you want it. But we miss that. No, no, no. I, I want that because it's not so much the value of the gift, but it's the, what, what was motivated behind that gift. And that's what God's doing for us. Love is accomplishing something greater than what our finite minds can understand. And if we don't open our eyes to that, you're going to just see life as just a random set of happenings that really don't mean anything and there's no force behind it there's no love behind it whatever another day another dollar another pretty face you don't know it's it there's 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 love happening behind what's going on there's love behind the scenes love behind the curtain of what's happening in your life now keep that in mind because th just put a pause on that and let me switch gears for a minute. I'm sitting this week and I'm meditating on all that God's been showing me in all this. And uh, all of a sudden the Lord opens to me, makes this statement to me. <clears throat> that life is a series of open doors and closed doors and nothing more. And I went, what? Is that me? Did I? So I sat there and meditated on that and I thought, okay. As I'm meditating on that, my eyes are being opened more and more to that 
that, that statement that he made to me. Well, how do you, know you know God made that statement to you? Well, when, when, when thoughts come to you that just come out of nowhere, and I'm not really thinking about a particular thing, I'm just meditating on God and, and some stuff, and then boom, it's just out of the blue a thought comes. A thought I never had before. I pay attention to that. And the thought was that life is a series of open and closed doors and nothing else. And it's like it cannot be that black and white and that simple. Well, there's detail in all that. You can, you know, but the just of it. Now think about this. How is life a series of open and closed doors? Think about it. Let's just start with, I'm not going to start with your infancy. Let's just go when you became an adult. Because you can't really make decisions as an infant. And as a five, four, six, seven, eight year old, you're, 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 you're not capable of making So let's start as an adult, 18 plus, over. Start that. When you, there, some of you went to college. You may, have been, you may have applied for certain colleges and you didn't get accepted. That's a closed door. Now right now you may be in a geographical area. You're 18. You graduated from high school. You're putting in applications and you may have about 10 schools you want to go to. And there may be, the majority of those may be closed doors by them not accepting your application. And then there's these ones who congratulate you that you have been accepted. So you're going to make a choice based on what doors were opened, what doors were closed, and it may even geographically change where you live, depending upon the college that you're enrolling into. You may have wanted to do one local, but you couldn't get into one, so you had to go to one. Or maybe you wanted to get the hell out of West Virginia, but you couldn't get accepted, so now you're stuck here. But it's not a stuck here once you understand what I'm saying. You're not stuck here. Well, I couldn't get out. There are no opportunities. I put applications. I put resumes. I've done... Whoa, wait a minute. It, it, it's, it, is this thing not God's will? Is this thing not about God's eternal purpose for my life? The closed doors are His no's and open doors may be His yes. So my life, whether I was taken geographically out of an area or or kept in, hemmed in a geographical area based on the decision of what college I want to go to. That's not random stuff happening. And then we moan the blues because I didn't get in. No, no, no. See, once you understand this, you once you understand this, I'm going to tell you why you don't, most people don't understand this. Because it's about our will, not His. And we are, we are spoiled by the Christianity that we're raised in, that we're supposed to get everything we want in life, and when we don't, we get depressed, we get mad, we get angry, we don't get our way, and I'm gonna tell you, until you come to the death of your will, you're gonna live a miserable existence with God because you and Him are gonna be in embattled indifference the rest of your life until you surrender your will to His. So I can't get upset at a closed door I wanted that. I needed that. You don't understand. Oh, man, God knows. What do you mean he don't understand? He created you and foreordained your life. You're the one who doesn't understand. I can't talk to babies. This message is not designed to spoon feed people who want their will and nothing else. I can't. I have, I have, I have nothing to say to people that are on that level because I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going to downgrade this message for that group of people that haven't grown up yet and haven't died to that. This won't work with people who want their own way. So turn this message off and walk away. I'm not catering to your will. This is not about, has never been about your will. I, I have already led that life of infancy spiritual infancy when I never got my way with God I did boo-hoo I cried the tears I put the fist up to God I cussed him out I walked away from not walked away from him but walked away from the will of God at times because I wanted my will and produced a bunch of error in my life as a result but God let me go around those mountains until I grew up and I'm no longer fighting for my will so going back to my illustration, college is an, is an example. Okay, so you go to college, you graduate, and you get out, and maybe you found, maybe there's somebody in college you liked. 
Do you understand that when you ask people out on dates, them saying no to you is not necessarily them rejecting you, but God saying no, that person's destiny doesn't line up with your destiny. So when you, you know, we did this growing up. We had, I mean, how many people have you asked out growing up as a single person? And how many no's did you get versus how many yeses did you get? And the yeses did you got, they didn't work out. These were all opened and closed doors. I don't understand why it's not working out. Because it's this closed door. Let it go ahead and, look, go ahead and let it close. Walk on. Move away. Don't work on something that God's not in. It, it, or a dead end. That was a dead end. No, that, that was a closed door. Move on. See, are, are you getting this? I'm telling you life is a series of open and closed doors. And it starts with college. It goes to asking people out, dating people. And who you ultimately marry is that open door. Everything else was a closed door. To even what house you bought. You may have put a bid on a house and that person owned that house said no. You're, you're, you're not giving us enough money. Well guess what? You didn't buy that house. Closed door. Rather than get, I just, we like the layout. It was just the perfect house. I don't know why. You, no. Closed door. Move on. I am on a quest to look for the things that God has made available, for, available to me by way of open doors. And the ones that are closed, I thank God for closed doors. You know, some guy wrote a, a, a song, Thank God for Unanswered Prayer. Or, is it, was it an unanswered prayer? Huh? It's a country song. I don't know anything about it. And all you people out there like country, so you know what I'm talking about. Thank God for Unanswered Prayers. They did a movie on it. What are you looking to be like that for? You don't... We don't listen to country. You guys aren't... You're an actor. Come on, you're an actor. Yeah. Well, you know, we are mad at God for an unanswered prayer. No, unanswered prayer is God saying, no, nah, I ain't giving you that. <laughs> no, no way. You don't have a clue what that would do to you if I gave that to you. But we're not, we're not privy to that revelation, although we ought to be, but in our limitless of not knowing God and the whole plan, we're mad. You know, I didn't get that. And he's not doing this. He's not doing that. Life is a series of open and closed doors. And when there is no open door or closed door, you are just basically going down a hallway. You know there are hallways with no doors? Just hang in there. Keep walking. This is what life is. You're in God's building and there are doors. Some doors are open. Some doors are closed. And some places there's just long hallways that you just keep walking and walking, thinking, wow, there's just nothing but walls in. Well, that's part of it. Now, the other thing I said last week that God showed me, keep that in mind, is that the blessings will never be at the expense of God's purpose for you. So God's not going to open a door that's going to take you out of his purpose. And God's not going to close a door that is part of your purpose. If, if you understand this is all about God's eternal purpose, you are mandated to have the right doors opened and the right doors closed. And we can't be babies about it. We just keep walking down the hallway knowing that this is part of God's plan, this long hallway. Right? I'm just telling you what, so all the blessings and all, not, God's not going to allow anything in your life that's going to take you out of his purpose. So we've got the scriptures that God works all things after the counsel of his will. Ephesians 1.11. We've got Romans 8.28 that God causes all things to work together for good according to his purpose. The good's not according to your purpose that he's working out. The good is according to his purpose. So what you deem as good may not be what he deem as good. So you've got to go to purpose. And we, we always miss out on God's working all things after, the, after, after, the, after uh, all things working together for good. But we always miss 
that main thing for me that builds my faith on that, per, on that scripture is it's according to his purpose. Because I know that if it's according to his purpose, it's good and it is right. But if I don't put that purpose in there, if Paul didn't put that purpose in Romans 8, 28, then we got to define what's good and what's not good. I don't know if this is good or not. In my eyes, it's good, but in God's eyes, it may not be good. But forget about it. Is it according to purpose? Yes. Then it's good. Now look at Psalms 139, verse uh, 13. All of God's, now I'm going to say this as you're turning there. All of God's works are in accordance with his purpose, which is your next. And it starts with your birth. Watch this. Your birth was God's next. I want you to think about it. It starts with your birth. I was born June 16th, 1963. That was God's next for this, for this world. Oh, you really think you're something, don't you? I, I, I must be. He created me. He dispatched me down here June 16th, 1963. I'm his, I was his next. you got to look beyond time, beyond the heavens in the beginning and, and say before the worlds were created. God had you in mind. When you were born, that was his next for this world. And you were placed here for a purpose for your, your generation. Not to be hidden somewhere and never exposed to life. You were not to be hidden and, and, and put somewhere. So that's what the world does. It makes you feel like you're nobody and that you have no purpose. And you just need to go sit down over there because no one wants to hear from you. But when you understand your birth was his next. Now look at Psalms 139. Verse 13. This is what David said. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. At knitting, he created us. As he did Adam out of dust, he created us. He's the, a master weaver in our mother's womb. He is directly involved in fashioning us into the person he wants us to be. And it's for his purpose. Now, verse 13 says you created me, or you created my, depending upon your translation, innermost being. Now, you know what that Hebrew word means for innermost being? What the Hebrew word for innermost being is that God created? It, the Hebrew word's kidney. Like your kidneys? So what, what, what does that mean? Now, the Jews used this word to express... And this is what God created, and the Jews used this word to express the seat of longings and desires. So God created, while I was in my mother's womb, he weaved me, knitted me together, and created my kidneys, which is the seat of my longings and desires. You're going to come into this world with a set of desires and longings that, that are your bent in life on what direction to go in. If you're all about a particular thing, and that's your dream, and you're all about it, that's your bent. That's, that's what God knitted you to be. So don't let people kill your dreams and your desires and your longings. They were knitted for the purpose of God. You'll know that whatever you come out in this world with desires and longings and dreams for is part of the purpose you were created here for. And the giftings God gave you. Use them for his purposes. Not for the purpose of the devil. Not for the purpose of the world. And not solely for the purpose of making money. But for the purpose finding out I'm here for the purposes of God. So God creates your emotions, your moral sensitivity, your personality. Basically you're bent in life. And you're the result of the attentive, careful, thoughtful, intimate, detailed, creative work of God. You can never be dissatisfied with the way you are and who you are in life. Well, I don't fit with those people over there. You're not supposed to. Well, they kicked me out. Well, you, well great. 
No, you, they didn't kick you out. If they kicked you out, they did you a favor because you didn't belong over there. And you didn't have enough sense to realize you didn't belong over there, so you had to wait for them to kick you out. Did Jonah below, belong on that boat in the divine plan of God? No. He didn't belong on that boat. He was in rebellion when he got on that boat. They had to kick him off. He would have never got kicked off had he not gotten on that boat. Even the fish swallowed him. Fish swallows food. The fish says you don't even belong in me. And spits him out. He, he, he ain't even wanted by a, a shark. A whale. Who's hungry? Nobody wants Jonah when Jonah is not flowing in the purposes of God. You're trying to get into groups. You're trying to get into things you, ain't, you don't belong in. You're trying to even probably stay in a job you don't belong in. Not about anybody here personally. I'm speaking generally. More people listening to this than just us. Let me say this again. You are the result of the attentive, careful, thoughtful, intimate, detailed, creative work of God. And that makes you a treasure on this earth. That you got to, I don't care if anybody else doesn't recognize it. You have to recognize it. Do you understand when the, when, when the heavenly host looks at you? I, I know this sounds, this is, this, this sounds, this sounds stupid. But it's true. When the, and heaven, when the heavenly host looks at you, you are breathtaking in their eyes. Now, have you ever been to the Grand Canyon or one of the seven wonders of the world or whatever? Some, some, some breathtaking thing that God created on this earth and you look at it and you're like, it just, wow, I mean, it's just huge. It's breathtaking. That's, that's God's creation, right or wrong. Are you God's creation? You know, it's, it's so... This is how fallen... I want you to listen to what I'm about to say. This is how fallen we are. We will look at somebody and go, Oh my God, she's ugly. Oh my God. He is... God is just not... You know, God looks at... God can't... God created you and there is no way He looks at you like that. We'll look, at, we'll look at the Grand Canyon and sit back and go, wow. And then look at someone and go, ugh. Right? And then we view ourselves by the way people look at us. I didn't, well, I've, been to, I've been to the Grand Canyon, I know, at least six times, half a dozen times. But I have never looked and go, I've seen potholes better looking than that. I, you you never you never cease to look at that going, man, that is this is crazy. This is wild. <clears throat> huh? This is how God, the heavenly host, sees us. Breathtaking. And we can't fathom that because life and people look at us with disdain. You're a gift to the people around you. And yet they just, there's other people that look at you and despise you and disdain you. So don't let those people define who you are or your placement or purpose in life. They're not your creator. They didn't create you. They didn't choose you as, a, as an inheritance. You're obviously not their inheritance. You're not something that you're going to gift them in. I know there are people that God's gifted me, I will never reach, and they'll look at me right in their face and totally miss who I am and my placement in their geographical area, but that's okay. I don't <clears throat> care. I know who I am and who God created me to be and what gifts and talents and how he fashioned me. And David said... Going back to Psalm, you you um, you created my innermost being. You formed me in my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. He goes on to say in verse 14, I praise you as a result. I don't raise my fist and go, why'd you make me like this? David didn't see that. He saw everything about him outwardly, inwardly, and said, verse 14, 
Psalm 139, I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. The world will not allow you to praise God for how you're made because the world looks at you and says, you don't count, you're ugly, go away. You don't, you're not part of this clique, you're not part of this club, you're not part of this neighborhood, you're not part of this town. Because of your financial status or your lack of, of, of this, that, or the other. Or because we know your reputation precedes you and we don't like you for what you've done in life. So we don't want you around. No, David says, I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was being made in secret... He says, your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. And we've, we've, we've talked about that verse. That's all in that verse right there. Psalms 31, 15 says this. Now, I'm, I'm just going to jump around because I've got to get over here. Psalms 31, 15 says, my times are in your hand. Not only my birth, but my death will be his next. Not next for earth but next for heaven. See, when I was born on this earth, my birth was the earth's next. This is what I'm doing for her. This is what I'm doing. This is what I'm doing for planet earth, June 16th, 1963. His name is Greg. This is what I'm doing for heaven, whatever the date of my death is. God's next for heaven will be my death when I depart from here and go over there. That will be heaven's next when I enter. See, that's just, you may think that, that just makes you like you're just some real big thing here. I am. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I've been chosen by God. I, I, I have to see myself that way or I, I deny the treasure he calls me. I have to see myself as his possession, his inheritance. And it's great when you understand you're part of some, something bigger and greater than this earth. Job 14.5 says, Seeing his days are determined, the number of his months are with you. Thou hast appointed his bounds that he cannot pass. Another translation says, He cannot live a minute longer than what he's supposed to. You're not going to live a minute longer than you're supposed to. Your life is purposed by birth and death. And neither one, your birth or death, will be an accident. <clears throat> you will be here to the minute God says you're not supposed to be here, up to the second you're not supposed to be here. So if you don't see that your life has meaning down here, in between your birth and death, if those things are predestined and purposed, which the scriptures are there, then everything in between is purposed by God as well. And the devil is not going to win in your life. Acts 17, 6 says this, and he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. God created each of us, and all the experiences of our lives, day by day, were written down in God's book before we were born. Everything in between. Where we're going to be, when we're going to be born, everything from the beginning to the end and all in between. God created each of us uniquely to fulfill his plan for our lives that he is ordained. And God's plan for you and his creation of you are consistent. Let me say that again. God's plan for you and, his, and, his, and the way he created you, how he created you, who he created you, and the plan are consistent. Meaning this, he's not going to allow a blessing in your life that's going to take you out of his purpose. He's not going to allow something evil in your life that's going to take you out of his purpose. You are secured in your day-to-day -day living with God. This all includes all the changes of life, all the seemingly chance or random happenings, which we know aren't, don't exist, all the sudden and unexpected turns of events, both good and bad, that occurs in our lives, all written in God's book, our book, before the worlds were created. Open doors, closed doors, long hallways, short hallways, the balance of accepting life as it is and the balance of improving it when we can. 
is where you may get stuck in everything I just said. So what do you mean by that? When do I accept things as supposed to be of God? And when do I not accept things and have a mandate to improve my life. Because see, if you just take this, well, then I'm just not going to do anything. I'm just going to sit here. What is, you know, what's supposed to be will be. What's supposed not to be is not going to be. And um, we'll just, no, that, that, when people say stuff to me like that, that shows their ignorance to me. It's like that, well, then that just means God's giving us a license to sin. That's just ignorant. When you, if somebody says that to me about grace, that's a license, they, they're ignorant. They don't understand grace. And I'm no longer going to, I'm tired of dealing with people like that. Or when you talk about rest. Well, faith without works is dead, brother. You know, these are these little cute antidotes that, that just show the ignorance of people. I think what it comes boils down to is my lack of patience with people anymore. Is a fact that a professor can't teach kindergarten. And I've got to let the kindergarten teachers teach kindergarten people. And I gotta quit dealing with ignorance. That's my lack of patience. Because I'm coming to the conclusion, what's wrong with me? Why is it that I don't have patience for that kind of stuff anymore? Don't just, you know, you gotta God helps those who help themselves. Okay, you need to go back to kindergarten. And there's probably a lot of good kindergarten teachers that can help you with that statement right there. But I'm tired. I am so far beyond those those little antidotes or cliches or whatever you want to call them those comebacks I'm try, you know because I feel like every time I talk I gotta I gotta deal with that and I'm wasting my time dealing with that yeah. and here's one of those other things well I just that means everything's supposed to be I'm, I guess I guess if I have an opportunity if I'm God, you will improve if you want to improve an area of your life it's because the grace of God put, put, put that in you to improve it it's like, well, then I can't change. No, you'll change what, if you don't want to change something, guess what? You ain't supposed to change it. And if you're happy with things the way they are, then that's pretty much where you're supposed to stay without changing anything. If there's a discontentment within you, recognize the discontentment is from the Father. So press on and look for open doors. Keep pressing on for open doors. And when there's room for improvement, improve. Why, why do I have to even just say what I just said? I have to recognize that my life is a series of the open doors, the closed doors, and the long hallways. As I'm walking down the hallways, people are going to be in my hallway. What are you doing in this hallway? I, I didn't ask you to be in this. I can't help you being in this hallway, so I have to deal with you. I didn't want this situation happening in the hallway. Or when I walked through the open door, I didn't realize that situation was going to happen. I can't control certain things, right? As a matter of fact, you're going to find out most of the stuff in your life you have no control over that's happening to you, not happenstance, and not random acts or chance, because we already zeroed that out last week. That's why last week was important to, under, to, to hear. Look what, Peter, look, look what Jesus says to Peter. Jesus is about to leave. You want to talk about the will of God? And Jesus, this is what Jesus says to Peter in John chapter 21, verse 18. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. You know, I'm finding that to be true in my life. When I was young, I, had, I it was like all these opportunities. And I went through all of them. And I, when I was young, I could do anything I wanted to do. They told me the sky was the limit, and I believed it. And I went as far as I could go and did. I was all over the place. Now, in that mode, I made a lot of mistakes, but I was too young to understand open, closed doors, sovereignty of God, providence. So I was blind to God working. I just saw everything as an opportunity. 
and I could just do. And when you're young, you don't have family. You you may ha you, you may not even have a job at that point if you're if you're real young. And so everything is an opportunity, all kinds of opportunities when you're young. But you realize when you start getting older, your opportunities become less and less. Maybe because. You know, now you have a career and it's not a job at McDonald's and then you go from McDonald's to Wendy's to Burger King to Walmart. Yeah, you can bounce all over the place because those aren't career jobs. But when you get a career job, you just don't bounce. Huh? And then if you're dating, you can go from this girl to that girl to that girl to this girl. Hey, I'm, I'm, I, don't, I just want to go out. I don't want to date. I just want to hang out. But when you're married... All that disappears. Career job, marry, kids, house, mortgage, you're limited now. You just can't move freely as you used to. What he's saying to Peter, I know what he's saying to Peter. But there's a principle here. That when you get older, life is going to happen to you. More things are going to happen. See, when you're young, you can go everywhere you want. But the, he says to Peter, but when you get older, you're going to stretch out your hands and another's going to take you places you don't want to go. Things are going to happen you don't want to happen. All according to the purpose and plan, sovereign, choice, eternal purpose, whatever you want to call it, God's happening to you. Well, life happens. This is life happening to me. Yeah, but it's God happening to me. You understand? This is so. What, you, what, what is he saying to Peter? These people that when you stretch out your hand, they're going to take you places you don't want to go. Things are going to happen. You don't. He he was he was he was prophesying Peter's old age, which means it had to be God's will, or he wouldn't have prophesied it. This is Jesus telling Peter about his life as he gets older. So. Things are going to happen to you that you don't want to happen to you. But you've got to see it as God overall watching out for you, allowing it to happen for His eternal purpose and your ultimate good. I'm tired of our definitions of good. I'm tired of our definitions of prosperity. I'm tired of our definitions of success because they're not God's. They're, they're America. They're the Western culture's definitions. I could ask you what prosperity is, and your definition is going to be different from a third world country person. Because they're going to look at your life as you are filthy rich. My God. You have carpet. You have insulation. And you've got a big screen TV. People in the third world, you know, the, I don't know what the average minimum wage is worldwide, but it used to be like $1.50. I don't know what it is now. Maybe, maybe less than that even years ago when I heard it. And we're pushing for $9 an hour or whatever they want minimum wage to be. But in the context of America, $9 an hour in, in context to a guy who has a really good career making $20 an hour. I'm poor, but in context to the world that makes $0.75 cents an hour, that's rich. You got to quit. America has ruined you as a Christian. This culture, this Western culture, you have, a, you have a Western culture mindset that's ruined your interpretation of what the Bible is, of what rich is, what success is. Success is not having a college degree, a white a house with a white picket fence, and a, and, a, and a wife, and kids, and a retirement. That's not success. There's nowhere in the Bible that that's success. That's America's definition of success. And you understand to get that kind of a life, you have to bend and bow to the system that creates that definition. If you don't bow, if you don't bow to that, I gotta have a college. I mean, there, there's people, there are smart, rich people today telling you that that degree is a waste of money and time, and they don't even go that route anymore. These are your leaders today saying that, but. But, the, but what's that do for making money for the institution? Of course, it's the institution. Then you got the government who's giving out the loans. They're all in bed together. You've got to do this. You've got to do this. No, not if God doesn't want me to do that. And because I don't have a college degree doesn't make me not a success. 
And because I may be divorced, that doesn't make me not a success. Success is doing the will of God. Fulfilling the purpose. And the prosperity is I'm rich in Him. I love America, but man, they have really warped us in our mindset. Let me give you a scripture here. 1 Corinthians 7.21. This is, an, this is an obscure scripture, and you'll gloss over it in your readings, but there's a principle here. It says, Paul speaking, were you a slave when called literal slavery? He says, don't be concerned about it. I don't believe Martin Luther King would have agreed with that. Or Abraham Lincoln. What's he say here? See, in Paul's day, there was slavery. And it was legal. It had nothing to do with collar. There were slaves before blacks. Black people were slaves. There were people, that was their job. They didn't get an inheritance from family. They were like the butler and the maid. They worked on the farms. They worked in the houses. That was their job. They were taken care of. That was probably the lowest thing you could be as a slave. But it was part of the culture. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I think it's wrong to enslave people. But watch what Paul's talking about in view of the culture in which he lived in. Were you a slave when called? Which means, did you get saved? Did you hear the gospel message while you were a slave of some rich guy? That's the context here. Were you a slave when called? Don't be concerned about it. But if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of that opportunity. In other words, if you were a slave born again, can you get out of that slavery? Yeah, go for it. Go for freedom. But if you can't get your freedom, then don't be concerned with it because this salvation is greater than where you are economically, where you are placed in society. You're going to have a calling and purpose that supersedes your, your vocation down here, whether it's being enslaved or free. That's what Paul's saying. This is bigger. So let's not get concerned. Were you working in McDonald's when you got saved? Well, if you can get a better job, go for it. But if not, hey, fulfill the call and purpose while you're working at McDonald's. What's he saying? Don't be so concerned with where you find yourself because when you understand the purposes and plans of God, where you are is where you need to be. If you can get out of it and better yourself, Go for it. But if you can't, it's where you're supposed to be. Are you getting that? So you know what that tells me? That this American gospel has literally screwed up my thinking completely. Because when I watch Christian television and I hear the main theme and emphasis in Christians around me, they're taking their cues from, from the pulpit and Christian TV. They dominate the airwaves. It's the dominant message today. That I am about improving myself all the time. I am about getting the best out of life they have me completely taking thought of my life all the time. They're telling me how I need to get out of this, get out of that. Hey, I got enough voices around me contradicting what God wants from me. I don't need my own brothers and sisters who should know better on Christian television feeding me a bunch of this bull. This, what you're hearing is not the message. Because what I'm telling you is, I watch, look, listen, there is nobody that you know that watches this stuff or used to like I did and, and, and preached some of it like I did, considered a lot of it, read the books, heard the messages like I have. And I'm telling you, they made me feel bad about my life that I never could attain to anything. And every time I reached out and failed, it was my fault. 
when all the while I'm reaching out to succeed like they're telling me, and they're all closed doors. I'm not supposed to succeed by their definition of success. And now I'm thinking like I'm a second-class Christian that I don't I don't make a, a, as much money as they say I I mean did I tell you about the uh, two, did I talk about 2003 did I say that to you in the last couple messages that I went in, down to Louisiana in 2003 and sat there and this is from the horse's mouth I sat there in front of Creflo Dollar and he said to me and about a thousand of us sitting in this church that every single one of us has millionaire status on the inside of us. And that every born-again believer can be a millionaire. Now either you're going to sit there and call me a liar, or he said it. Fine, call me a liar. I'm telling you, I heard him say it. As those thousand people and the two guys I was with heard him say it. And sitting there I'm thinking, wow, is that true? Is there a... Is there a million dollar status on the end? So I gotta find out the keys. Yeah. I gotta find out the secrets, the principles, the steps to this million dollar status. And then last week, I'm watching Creflo Dollar. And you know what he says to everybody watching him around the world? Well, not everybody's supposed to be a millionaire. <laughs> and because I remember, I'm like, okay, now I got out of that million dollar status a few years after I heard it and said, oh, I, so, but what if? That was 2003, that's 11 years ago. What if for 11 years, I continued to believe that and bought all his materials and jumped through all those hoops and believed and believed and believed and all the while I'm depressed and discouraged and I hate myself because I, that's not working, it's not happening. And then I hear the guy who put that bondage on me tell me, now I'm going to be one pissed off individual and totally dismayed and disgruntled with Christianity because you just duped me. Was he wrong now or was he right then? Is he going to turn around 10 years later and say, no, we do have millionaire status? No, you know what? Screw all of you people. I'm serious. Every television evangelist and every person out there, I'm only responsible to hear what the Spirit is saying to me and get this message right. Because I'm tired of being led by the nose by the Haggies and the Myers and the Bennies and all those people out there that change with the wind. And at the end of every message, they want my money. I'm tired of it. I am the only one with the Holy Spirit who has the anointing to teach me. He's the only one that can open my eyes and put me where I need to be and set me on a path that no one's going to take me off. Now, I am sit here as a pissed off preacher because I have been duped by most of these people on television because I thought, because I was raised in Christian television. I worked for Christian television for years. So I know all this. And I'm coming to realize these people are in it for the wrong reasons. They're merchandising a gospel. They've come up with a message that tickles my ears and, 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 and entices my flesh and then for me to get what they have I got to give money that is the bottom line and if the church doesn't wake up they're going to continue to be duped by these individuals and I'm telling you it's my own fault I really don't need to be pissed off at them I need to be pissed off at myself for not believing what the scripture says I don't have need of a teacher I have the anointing to teach me and I've allowed these men to be my teachers and not the Holy Spirit and you need to be mad at yourself as well if, if, if you've been duped by it. The message today is wrong. It's not about what you can get from God. It's not about you using God. You know the message is God using you? It's not you using God and these blessings and all this stuff that we're supposed to get is never going to be at the expense of what God's purposed for our lives. 
So I'm looking at all this stuff I don't have and thinking there's something wrong with me when all the while God says you're never going to have all that because it's not in accordance with what I've called you to do. Quit. I mean, sooner or later, don't you think I've got to give up the dream of becoming a rocket scientist? I mean, fine, I'm 10 years old. I want to be a spaceman. I want to be an astronaut at 10. But at 50, I think it's time to grow up. Or my mom raised me saying, you could be the next president of the United States. That's fine, but at 50, don't you think I ought to give that up? It's not in accordance. My I, the IQ that I would need for a rocket scientist is not in accordance with what God's called me to do. So I, will, I, I don't care that I don't have an IQ like that. I don't care that I'm not borderline genius. Because if I was borderline genius, it would take me off of the purpose that I'm supposed to be on. I guarantee it would. Because if I had, if I had a, that high of an IQ, I wouldn't think anymore along the lines that I'm thinking. I'd be thinking on a different set of lines that would put me on a different course of life. I believe once you get this, it's going to revolutionize your thinking about how you, who you are and how you live and what you're called to. You cannot be dist Remember the book I read a couple weeks ago? The guy says, once you understand this, a Christian can no longer be depressed. All right, let me close with this. Turn to Philippians 4.11. I'm going to close with this. This, this. this here sums it all up. This is Paul speaking. Philippians 4.11 Not that I speak in respect of want. Not that I speak in respect of want. Let me stay, stay there. Let me give you another scripture. Hebrews 13, verse 5. Somebody turn there. Hebrews 13, 5. Now watch. Paul says in Philippians 4, 11, not that I speak in respect of one. What does Hebrews 13, 5 say? Make sure that your character is free from the love of money. Okay, that's not, that's not King James, is it? Somebody read that to me in the King James. Do we have a King James? You got King James? Okay, what does it say? Let your conversation be without covetousness. Okay, now, Paul says not... Now, keep, keep that there, because I'm going to have you say that again. Philippians 4.11, Paul says, Not that I speak, his conversation, talking, not that I speak in want or coveting. What, what, is it, what does it say? Let your conversation be without covetousness. That kills all the faith teachers. Because their message is more and more and more. And Paul says, my conversation is not about coveting. My conversation is not about wanting. Keep that in mind. Sidebar. Pause that. Let me read on. Philippians 4.11. Keep that there. Okay. okay. 4.11. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned. I have learned. The church hasn't learned this, but Paul has. So if Paul's learned this and the church hasn't, we also need to learn this. There is a learning lesson here. 
There's a transformation in you and me as Christians that Paul got that the church hasn't gotten yet. Not that I speak in respect of one, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am in, therewith to be content. They won't let me be content because they keep telling me I've got millionaire status on the inside of me. They keep telling me that I should be rich and that I should have more and more and more. And if I keep having that kind of message, I'll never be content where I'm at. they got me always pressing forward for more, never being content where I'm at. And this is why I'm mad. I have never been content with the Christian message from day one. They've always got me working harder and wanting more. From the legalists to the faith teachers. I have never been able to learn contentment because they've never taught it and I've never had it. And therefore, I quit jobs. Not me. I'm speaking out of somebody in general. That's why I have high credit card debt. I, that's why I can't hold a job. That's why I've been divorced three or four times. Because it's in me to want more, more, more. To have, have, have. And I've never been content with what state I am in. They're always trying to change my state. When God says, or Paul, through God... Be content. I've learned. We've not learned this. Paul's the only one in the New Testament who understood the mystery of contentment. It's an art of living the church has never taught us. Because it's America. It's wrapped up in merchandising and materialism. For Paul did not, now listen, Paul did not seek after great things in this world. And our motivational messages is to do that. Seek for greatness. Paul says, well, I'm, why seek for greatness? I'm content. Wherewith I am at, wherewith I am in, or whatever. Watch, Paul did not seek after great things in the world. He did not long for great wealth. There's not a message you can find. In fact, you'll find that you'll find what I'm saying when you read between the lines. It's not really reading between the lines, like that statement there. My conversation will never be about covet, coveting. You'll never get a sense of covetousness in the way I speak and the way that I teach. That's what Paul's saying. So Paul did not seek great things in the world. He did not long after great wealth. His heart was taken up, his heart was not taken up with the things of this world, but better things he speaks of, which are heavenly things, spiritual things. He says, for whether I have or not, I am fully satisfied. Whether I have or whether I don't have, and many of us sitting here know what don't have means. He says, I'm fully satisfied. The message today makes me not fully satisfied. Sure. And it made me, has made me as, my, as a Christian, my walk with God miserable because I'm, I'm wanting more and more and more because I'm thinking that's what I should have. And if I don't have it, something's wrong with me. Something's wrong with my faith. My faith ain't up to par. I need more faith. I need to obey more. For whether I have or not, Paul says, I am fully satisfied. Basically, what he was saying is, I have enough. Even when you look at me and it doesn't look like I have anything, I have enough. Why? He knew that the allotment of God's riches was in accordance where God had him at that time and place, that season of his life. I'm not preaching poverty. I'm saying where you are right now, you have what you're supposed to have. The income you have, everything. Unless God, and I don't think anybody here, and, and I've always got to say there are, there are exceptions to this rule. And that is this. God told you to take a $100,000 job and you just flat out refused it. I don't find very many people like that. And, but in case there's one out there, your poverty is a result of God giving you a blessing and you didn't take it because you're an, you're an idiot. I guess there may be people, but most, I've, I've not met anybody. Most people that I meet, they want the will of God. And if God's dangling at the $100,000 job, I haven't found anybody that hasn't taken it. 
Do you know where, do you know where most criticism comes from from people? Well, I can't believe you didn't take that job. It's just another freaking minimum wage job. Really? You're going gonna to pound me over that when I can just go out and get another one over there? I'm not talking about minimum wage jobs that are a dime a dozen. I'm talking about these career. And nobody that I know has ever turned down something that God said do this. And it was a divine carrot. And you had God's or God opening the door. God giving you the grace. And you still said no. I have never met anybody like that in my life. But just in case one, in, one exists, then he's an idiot. I ain't talking about that. And again, see how I had to go over there and do that? I had to talk to kindergartens in this college we're in. I had to cater to the kindergartens because I know how they think. Content, contentment, the lost art of living is lacking today in the church. Paul says in verse 12, I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. Again, this is something that's learned. Have you learned how to be brought down? Oh, did, I miss, did I misread that? I know how to be brought low. Well, this faith message and in today's Olsteins, God doesn't bring you down low. God's always going to take you higher and give you more. So with that kind of message, guess what? I have never been taught how to be brought down low. And if I am, it's the devil, not God. Because God would never bring me down low. And yet I can show you in Jeremiah, he says, I raise you up as a prince. I'll bring you down to the dung heaps. I'm the one who raises and, and, and brings down low. I, promotion doesn't come from the east or the west. Promotion comes from God. But are you ready to be demoted at times? Because Paul says right here, I know how to be brought low. Today's message is not teaching us how to be brought down low. You may go through a season where God says, I'm going to take you through something. I mean, he said to Israel, I led you to the waters of Mirabah. Mirabah means bitter waters. I led you to a place of bitterness. God would never do that. He, he chastises those whom he loves. He disciplines those whom he loves. Yes, he will do that. And if he doesn't do that, you're not one of the ones he loves. He loves you. This is all again, choose, chosen in love. If you're, being, if you're going through a season where God demotes you, Brings you down low. Learn to be content in that season. Because it's not all about elevation. It's about where does God want you. This season of your life, you're going to be a tent peg. You're not going to be that little top of the tent that everybody gets to see. You're going to be the tent peg for a season. You okay with that? Remember, he's the potter. You're the clay. You okay with that? But we bitch, moan, and complain when we're brought down low because we've never been learned. Paul says here, verse 12, I know how to be brought low. I know. And I've learned how to be content. Whatever state means, in what I am, whatever concerning or befalls me is what that means. In whatever state I am in. It says, I, in what I am is the literal meaning. And it means whatever concerns me, whatever befalls me, whether I have little or nothing at all. I have learned to be brought down low. I have learned to be content. But you cannot hear this in a, in, in, in a context of more, more, more. Work, work, work. Not in today's message. Paul says, though I have nothing, I possess all things. There's the paradox. Though I have nothing, I possess all things. Meaning this, guys, listen to me. You don't gauge what you have or what's not happening as you being a failure or God being mad at you or somewhere you're in God's third, fourth, fifth will. 
permissive will. What you have to understand, when Paul says, though I have nothing, I possess all things, he says, I am where I'm supposed to be, I'm right on time, and what I have is in accordance to the purpose of my life right now. See, what I have right now is in accordance with the purpose that, I, that God has for me. But if that purpose changes down the road, so will the allotment that he has for me. I have all things. All things are mine. But what's allotted to me is going to be in accordance with my purpose. And if my purpose changes, I will get more. This is why Paul said, with Christ, will he not freely give us all things? Well, do I, if, I, if I really take that literally, then that means I should have a bunch of cars, a bunch of houses, because all things, all, this is where the faith teachers get all messed up, the all things. But they don't say, no, it's not all things. So because they don't have five cars, they've got three, they're working on their faith more for the two more that they don't have yet. And that's not what it means. All things means all things in accordance to God's will for my life that's according to his purpose for me. So I'm going to get everything I'm supposed to get that's in accordance to where he has me and what he has me doing. Again, the analogy of the soldier that's on the battlefield. He doesn't finance his own fight. He doesn't find, he's not worried about the civilian affairs. He's concerned about the one who enlisted him. God called you. God called me. And he's going to give me everything I'm supposed to have pertaining to life and godliness. And Peter already told us that. I have all things. All things are mine as I'm serving him. That's why he says, take no thought for your life. Why in the world would God, would Jesus, tell his disciples, 12 of them, send them out and say, oh, before I send you out, give me your purse. Give me your wallet. Give me your bank card. Give me your ATM card. Give me all of this. Now go. Excuse me? You're sending me out. You, your purpose is to send me out with no money? No clothes? No nothing? He said, yeah. Then they came back days later. And he said, did you find that you had need? And they said, no, Lord. All our needs were met. What's he trying to say to you people in this? His calling, his purpose, he finances. He showed it to us by not giving them their money. And then when they came back, he said, so here's your purse, here's your staff, here's your clothes, here's your stuff. Just know I'm the one financing this, not you. And not even the people you may be presently working for. He'll use them, but the minute he sees fit to quit using them, you're going to be without a job. He'll find provision elsewhere. He'll have somebody else financing it. These people are not your, 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 your providers. God is. Lesson 101. I think it's time that the church has to wake up because the message today is not about purpose. It's about materialism. And we're all depressed, discouraged people because our lives do not emulate what Christian television says it ought to. So there's something wrong with me. No, there is nothing wrong with you. Learn the art of contentment. Here's what I'm saying. You may be right now. Let me tell you where I'm at. I'm walking down a hell of a long ass, hard, dark hallway. No doors. I don't even have opportunities to say no to. I'm in a hallway. And I but you know what? I'm supposed to be in that hallway. And I'm going to keep walking down that hallway and find the contentment the church ceases or has never known to show me about. I now am in this hallway. I used to be perplexed and mad and upset. Now I'm learning. And I'm not I'm saying I'm not mad still. I mean, I'd still love to have more opportunities. It'd be nice to have an opportunity to say no to. But I'm having to learn contentment. That mystery of contentment, which is the lost art of living in the church today. Of being content where I'm at. And I'll keep walking down that hallway content till I see some doors. Closed doors, open doors, whatever. Because my life is a, it consists of open doors and closed doors. 
And God is the one who engineers the doors, orchestrates the opening, the closings, the whole thing. And I just keep walking down there content, whistling. Whistle while we walk, not work, walk. And I'll enter into the work that he's already predestined for me to enter into. And you know what? It's really time we learn how to enjoy life. And, the, and I never learned it from the ch traditional church. I've never learned enjoyment. And I've never learned contentment from the message I've been brought up in all my life. I have, I have been mad at the world. Mad at God. Because I ain't getting what I'm supposed to get. Endorsed by my faith teachers and other motivational speakers. Why I'm not successful, I don't know why. But there must be something wrong with me. And I am, I, this is a treasure I'm his possession. You don't think he's going to take care of me? Yes, he's going to take care of you. And he's going to provide for you. And he's going to give you his best. If he didn't withhold his son, which is his best, you already have his best. Jesus. And everything you're going to get, you're going to get in Christ. And it's all going to be because you've been chosen in love. Cherish the life you have. Be content with the people around you and the provision you have. Enjoy life. Enjoy where you are. And when the opportunities come, they're going to come. When the hallway ceases to be long and starts shortening up and doors start showing up, you'll have opportunity. God will have closed doors, have open doors. You're going to get where you're supposed to get because he's the one who called and chose you. He's in charge. He's the potter. We're the clay. He's working in us to will and do his good pleasure. It's not about you. Listen, it's not about more, more, more and work, work, work. we got to get out of that more, more, more and work, work, work. And just start being content in whatever state you find yourself in. And when it's time to move, he'll move you. When it's time to go through somewhere, he'll, he'll motivate you to do that. For it is God who is at work in you. You're not going to miss an opportunity because God's at work in you. You're going to miss an open door for God's at work in you. He'll open your eyes. He'll give you the desires. He'll give you the motivation. He'll give you the strength. He'll give you the willpower. He'll give you the desire. It's all in him. When it's time to improve, you will, you will have the desire to improve your life. When it's not, you'll just stay content in what state you find yourself in. Let's pray. Father, Open our eyes to your gospel, not America's gospel. Open our eyes to your kingdom, not the Western culture or civilization. I am not of this world. I have been crucified under this world. That means I'm crucified to this world's definition of success. I'm crucified to this world's definition of prosperity. I'm crucified to the church's definition of success. I'm crucified to the church's definition of prosperity. Because theirs is worldly. It's not more, more, more. Work, work, work. It's being in you. Knowing that you've worked this out. And everything I'm supposed to get, I'm going to get. And where I'm supposed to be, I'm going to be. Because you work all things out together for good, according to your purpose. So I may go to the right and left a little bit, but ultimately, God, I will stay on task. That's your promise to me, perseverance. And I rest in the work already done for me. I rest in the purpose already laid out for me. I rest in Jesus and I will be led by the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Father, I pray that you just open our eyes more and more to where we are. You are not, we have not missed God. We may not like where we're at. But when the time comes to move, he will move us. Until then, 
Be content in every situation you find yourself in. Learn the lost art of contentment. It's a mystery to the church. Shouldn't be. Should be a revelation to the church. But it's a mystery that Paul got. Open our eyes up to contentment, Lord. The art of living. And we rest in you, Father. We rest in your works. We rest in Jesus. For we have not only been chosen in him, chosen in your love, by your love, in him. And we rest in that. Amen. God bless you. See you next week.